guys so today i'm going to talk to you about books written in portuguese that i found here in edmonton alberta canada yay i went to the edmonton public library and they have a section of books written in other languages uh, besides english and uh, they have a tiny little section of books written in portuguese i requested some of them and uh, i'm gonna show you <laughs> So, the first of them uh, that caught my attention because of this title is this one. It's a very thin book, as you can see. It's called The Portuguese in Canada. It's by David Diggs uh, from the Department of History, University of Toronto. Yeah. So, I read it. It is a very thin book, so it's very easy to read. Uh, it was interesting. There was a lot of things about, that I didn't know about the history of Portuguese immigration to Canada. Uh, they start with the map here. Interesting. In 1971, the all the Portuguese people of Portuguese origin were distributed through the provinces and territories of Canada. As you can see, you know, this big sign here is Ontario. In uh, 1971, there were 63,145 uh, people of Portuguese origin in the province of Ontario alone. Yeah. Um, Quebec, also, uh, a large majority. British Columbia, where Vancouver is, with a large Portuguese community here. And then smaller groups, Alberta, yay, Alberta. Where I live, uh, there was 2,385 people of Portuguese origin in 1971, and of course less people here in the territories because it's really, really cold. Anyway, uh, there was here a sentence um, on the first chapter about the uh, Portuguese background that I, uh, well, I was really upset <laughs> because when I read this, uh, I thought, yeah, this person does know nothing about Portuguese history or culture. And the sentence is, uh, Portuguese migration was not a result of any particular government's policy or economic hardship during a specific period, but an intrinsic part of the Portuguese past, linked at first with uh, people in an empire in Brazil and parts of Africa, a flow which continued after independence, and in the second stage with sending workers to economies which offered greater rewards than those to be earned at home. Well, um... Uh, in the following pages, they have here some tables about some charts about um, the number of Portuguese people through the decades. And uh, the first Portuguese uh, immigrants in Canada, uh, statistically dated from uh, from 1940, 1951, so the 40s, 50s, and so on, and continue from that. So at that time. Portugal uh, was under a dictatorship, so the fact that uh, a lot of people immigrated not only to Canada but the United States or uh, to South American countries or to other countries in Europe, France, Germany, Luxembourg, Switzerland, etc., 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 uh, could be directly linked to the fact that at the time Portugal was living during the dictatorship, people uh, feeling oppressive, they were living, they were poor, they were seeking better lives and also to get away uh, from the censorship, dictatorship, oppression. And so when uh, it says here that P Portuguese migration was not a result of any particular government's policy or economic hardship during a specific period, uh, that's oh, yeah, really. Um, because sociologically and historically, it's proven that uh, the large flows of migration uh, happen uh, when their countries of origin have uh, are passing for. Uh, a period of uh, economic hardship, like now, for instance, uh, I read uh, Portuguese newspapers, Jornal Notícias, online, and um, 
the other day I read news about several thousands of doctors and nurses that from Portugal that went to United Kingdom and other countries in Europe. Uh, Portugal is passing uh, through a recession, through a period of, of economic hardship. So uh, more and more people decided to immigrate to seek better lives in other countries. So yes, Portuguese immigration or immigration from other other countries and from other people from other ethnicities and nationalities uh, can be directly linked to economic hardship from their own country or uh, in this case also to the result of particular government's policy. Yeah, because like I said, uh, the Portuguese, the first Portuguese people here in Canada uh, in the 20th century were um, uh, came in a time that Portugal uh, was ruled uh, by a dictator. So, yeah. So when I read this sentence, I totally disagree. Sorry, Mr. David Hicks, uh, but I totally disagree with you on that sentence, okay? Anyway, uh, other than that, the, the book was really interesting. Uh, talks about the how Portuguese migration is different depending the region that the person is in for, um, versus each region had a favorite destination for its immigrants preferences which became stronger over time because of individual and family ties. Continentals must often go to other parts of Europe within reach by road or train. Madeirans live mainly for South America, uh, for, uh, for South Africa, yeah, sorry, uh, Venezuela and Brazil, while Azorans a journey across the Atlantic to the United States and Canada. So um, then we talked up a little bit about the uh, Madeira and Azores. Uh, like I said here, the charts of the Portuguese migration uh, immigration to Canada uh, through the years, 1940, 1951, 51 to the 60s, 61 to the 70s, and so on. Um, the distribution to the provinces, yeah. how, how many people in, our, uh, in 1951 and 61 and 71, how many people were uh, in the Atlantic provinces, Quebec, Ontario, Prairies, Beach, Columbia, others. So it was interesting. Uh, mm -hmm. They also talk about here um, about newspapers and other media that uh, was created by the Portuguese community in um, in Canada. Uh, some newspapers, like the first Portuguese language newspaper, was Luso Canadiano, Portuguese Canadian, established in Montreal in 1959 by Eric Tavares Bell. Um, also. Talk about others like Correio Portuguese, the Portuguese Mail, founded in Toronto in 1963 uh, by Antonio Ribeiro, other newspapers, the Messageiro, the Messenger in Vancouver, Voice of Portugal, Voice of Portugal in Montreal, so uh, other ones like Novo Mundo, New World, from 1970 to 1973, Community. So uh, it was really interesting to see how. Uh, to see Portuguese uh, newspapers created uh, just for the Portuguese community in Canada. So, um, the other day I found some, some websites, some uh, Portuguese newspapers online. Uh, they have a PDF version. Um, they're mainly in the area of Toronto, Montreal, around that area, so not here in Alberta, fortunately. But uh, it is interesting either way to. Anyway, uh, so it's a very thin book, uh, recommend it, it's interesting. Um, as a Portuguese immigrant to Canada, it was inter interesting to see the differences between immigration, how immigration worked back then and how immigration works now in terms of policies, how easy or difficult it is for immigrants to make their lives here. So, um, it was really interesting. So, 
this is another one um, that I didn't had the opportunity to uh, to read yet because I requested uh, recently. Uh, this was uh, entirely very long, right? Uh, from the University of Alberta. Uh, there, here, there's something that is uh, really really cool. There doesn't have that doesn't exist in Portugal, which is uh, if the Amateur Public Library doesn't have the book that you want, they can request, uh, you can request a book or CD or DVD uh, to other libraries uh, within Canada, the United States, or even worldwide, which is really, really cool. <laughs> you can place a hold on it, then they will let you know when it's available. Just go to pick up uh, at your library, local library, could pick up this book, and it's really, really interesting, you know. So this one is from the University of Alberta, and uh, it's a, it's a very um, very old book. It's from December '97. Yes, it's here, right in the back. It's called the Portuguese uh, the Portuguese in Transition. It's a very tiny title here, Portuguese in Transition. Um, by John Hamilton and states here Mr. Hamilton teaches history at Burlington Central High School in Burlington, whatever that is. Uh, so it's uh, through the contents, it's very interesting to see. They talk about Portuguese history, all the invasions, barbarians, moors, etc. About the uh, Madeira Rhinosaurus, about the history of Portugal basically, also Portuguese way of life, about in terms of geography, agriculture, economy, political, uh, and now they have a chapter, of course, about the Portuguese in Canada, about historic ties, Portuguese Indians in Canada, Portuguese in Toronto, uh, church and welfare needs. Uh, it's very interesting. Then they have the government documents. Um, that sounds interesting. It's a, a good read. Uh, also, again, uh, the example said the other one seems to be about not Portuguese in Canada, uh, the Portuguese community in Canada, but this one goes further and deeper, I mean, uh, about the, an introduction about the history of, Can the, of Portugal and everything, so it will be interesting to read. So, uh, next one, it's a very thin one, also in Travel Library alone. Uh, and this is a document from the government of Canada. Uh, it's called Profiles Portugal. Immigrants from Portugal in Canada highlights. Uh, sounds interesting. They have a bilingual version, by the way. So this is the version in English. And I close it and turn it around. Open. And this is the version en français. So here, an English version, uh, my French is really rusty, uh, so I didn't read it yet as well, but uh, it seems very interesting. They talk uh, all those pages just about Portuguese uh, communities, Portuguese immigration to Canada in terms of age distribution, language, religion, family status, fertility levels, education, employment, income, etc. They even have charts, so very statistical and stuff, yeah, uh, so it's interesting. Anyway, uh, then I found this book, I read it, uh, it's called Illegally Blonde, it's um, a novel by a Portuguese Canadian, yeah, called Nelson Roberto, is or the author. Mm -hmm. uh, Cesar is a Portuguese Canadian, was born in a remote logging community in northern Ontario, grew up in a farming community in southern Ontario, and now lives in Toronto with her husband, three children, and golden retriever. Uh, it was interesting. And kudos for uh, the Portuguese community to uh, be able to publish books and express themselves. And um, as being Portuguese Canadians, and uh, this book is passes uh, part the beginning in Canada, then the rest in Portugal, because it's about um, uh, a teenager, uh, Lucy, Lucinda do Amaral, uh, who gets the teenage rebellion of dyeing her hair uh, blonde, and then gets home and realizes that uh, 
she was expecting the her parents to be very stricter, very uh, to be grounded for that or something. But uh, she realizes that there's way bigger problems than that. That um, she gets told that her family was illegal in Canada, and uh, they have they were going to be deported to Portugal. So and it starts from there and. Uh, and it's interesting to see, uh, you know, what she does in terms of desperation to go back to Canada and, uh, and what happens in the meantime in Portugal and uh, it, it, was, it was really interesting and like I said, kudos Portuguese, uh, Portuguese Canadians publishing books in Canada, uh, really interesting. Now, sorry, one of the books that I found, lots of books here. Uh, so, the rest is lots of books about Portuguese cuisine, yes. If you saw my last video, uh, you saw that I have your situation, because my Canadian family doesn't want to have a Portuguese Christmas dinner. Uh, here's I was a little bit offended by that, but uh, either way, I want to introduce, uh, if not for my tiny family, my tiny new Canadian family, I mean, I'd like to introduce, at least to my wife, uh, what Portuguese uh, cuisine is and how good Portuguese food is. So, from all those books uh, written in Portuguese that the Edmonton Public Library has, I requested some of them that are specifically about culinary. So I'm gonna show you right now. So the first one is not written in Portuguese, but it's about Portuguese cooking. It's this one, it's really interesting, called Portuguese Cooking, the Traditional Cuisine of Portugal by Carol Robertson. It's really interesting because um, although it's written in English, it's very authentic. Uh, I read a little bit of it and I went through the pages and uh, the person researched it the author researched and made interviews with people in Portugal that helped them translate the recipes from Portuguese to English. So there's still a f authenticity, although this book is written in English, not in Portuguese, but it's, uh, it's presented authentic Portuguese uh, food, So, which is really interesting. So next one in Portuguese, this tiny but very thick book called Refeições em Família Mil e Uma Receitas. Always nice. Uh, so they have, you know, it's a culinary book with lots of yummy, yummy uh, photos and uh, recipes. So I'll give it a try. And maybe someday I'll post on on blog how that went, me trying to cook Portuguese food and me with my wife. It's an idea that we've been talking about. That's why I, re I requested so many Portuguese uh, books about culinary. So next one is also uh, thick, very thin, very small, but very thick. I call uh, Receitas Simples para Novatos e Experientes. From Javier Gutierrez. So, uh, and is on the Portuguese section, if we can read it here on the, the label to confirm that's from the Edmonton Public Library. It says Portuguese. So, um, it's the same way uh, recipes in Portuguese uh, and about, in this case, uh, simple, easy recipes to do. Um, by the way, my wife is learning Portuguese. Yay. There's a Portuguese school here in Edmonton, so uh, and she has classes once a week. Uh, she's not fluent yet. She's trying. She's learning step by step. And um, I requested so many books in Portuguese because I thought it would be fun to uh, try to do some of those recipes following the recipe in Portuguese and it would be a fun way for her to for us to do an activity together and for her to uh, practice Portuguese at the same time. 
So anyway, continue. There's this one. It's called Duzentas Receitas Sobremesas Deliciosas. Yay. So it's about desserts. Uh, it's written in Portuguese as well. Very yummy, yummy uh, recipes and photographs. Oh, the next one is... <laughs> I showed the book. I showed the cover. Yeah, all people in Portugal know who this lady is. Filipa Vasconcelos. Uh, this book uh, is called As Grandes Receitas das Famílias Portuguesas. Uh, and that's awesome because um, I want to try to get one of these books uh, to, to my Canadian family, to my in-laws, uh, because they have a little bit afraid about trying Portuguese food and um, so uh, get them to know what Portuguese food is looks like and tastes like be a, a fun way to do so. So uh, authentic traditional Portuguese cuisine, you know, from uh, uh, a lady so famous in Portugal like Filipe Vasconcelos, uh, would be a good way to start. Uh, the only problem is that this book is written in Portuguese and my in-laws don't know Portuguese. They don't know one single word in Portuguese. <laughs> so, yeah. So I also requested the other book, the, um, the other one about Portuguese uh, cooking, but the one is written in English. That would be a better suited for them, at least at the beginning, I think. Uh, since it's written in English, for, so for them easy to read. And yeah, let's see about that. <laughs> so, like I said, yay. Uh, I was so excited when I saw that shelf with books written in Portuguese, you know, there at Edmonton Public Library, I like, yay, Portuguese! <laughs> I miss my country so much. Anyway, and the last book, the last, uh, it's about healthy food. It's called Mais Fruta e Legumes, Receitas Coloridas para Proteger a Nossa Saúde. There you go. So it's another culinary book in Portuguese, but about healthy food. So, and there you go. That's what I want to talk about to you. That uh, even in Canada, even in a place that doesn't have many Portuguese uh, uh, people, uh, of people of Portuguese origin, uh, at least not as big as Ontario and Quebec, uh, we still have books written in Portuguese uh, available for everybody that has a, a library card uh, from the Edmonton Public Library, which by the way this year, 2013, was free, the library card was free, uh, because it was the 100 years of the Edmonton Public Library, so uh, it was really nice. So bye bye. And uh, feel free to uh, comment next thing that you, next subject you want me to talk about. Uh, I'm always open to suggestions and um, see you next time. Bye.